Right. All right. Yeah. Oh, maybe down just a bit. So we're continuing in Colossians. And I think I got this a little bit too low, so. Have patience. Yeah, that was a song. Okay. A kid thing we used to do, a music machine. Have patience, have patience. <laughs> no need to worry. It was a snail. And there was, of course, a, I think a rabbit or something or other involved in it. But anyways, about the fruit of the spirit. And that was one of the fruit, of course, patience. Actually, fruit is, a, in Greek anyway, is a singular word there. So there's only one fruit of the Spirit that's just these seven things. It's like, you know, like an apple has different colors to it and different parts. So, anyway. All right, so today we're going to continue in Colossians. I'm um, still in chapter 1. Um, this will Today we're going to do verses 9 through 14. And um, basically this is still continuing with the introductory part of the letter that Paul is sending to the Colossians. Um, the first week we looked at basically the address, who was being addressed to and who sent it and so forth. And then last week, Ginger was going to the, through the part where Paul is giving thanks for them. And then today's really is more about the prayer that he has for them, but just kind of, um, background here so far in the eight verses that we've looked at um, what have we learned about God the Father well we learned that it's by his will for us for our calling he determines what our calling is and or what our anointing is those, for me those are kind of interchangeable terms um, in the olden days when somebody was called or they they were given a job like being a priest or a prophet or whatever they were anointed and um and uh, generally they had a big thing of oil um probably olive oil um, because in the middle east it, it grew anywhere so they thought it was blessed by god so generally it's olive oil and they'd like pour it on somebody's head and and it might like just hose them down kind of with oil um, but the oil symbolizes um, the holy spirit that's where our, uh, you know, God the Father calls us. He has a, he has the plan, and it's by His will that He wants us to do it. But we also have a will, so He's going to be doing stuff to try to get you to the place um, that He wants you to be at. But we can fight and squirm against it, kind of like when you know your kid, you're wanting to put him to bed or you're wanting to take him somewhere, and they're like squirming and junk for it and. Um, they like, oh, wait, or even your dog for that matter. Um, <laughs> you want them to go and have do their stuff over here, not over here. And um, trying to get them to go there, you might have to grab them by their neck and pull them over there. But um, anyway, that's kind of the way it works with us. But God doesn't force us, though he does a lot of stuff. He's, he gets people that actually are obedient to him to go a certain way or he'll... He'll, and he'll cause circumstances to happen that bring the right people. And I really still believe that about Byron, even though it seems bleak and dire. I'm, all things are possible to God. What's impossible to man is possible to God. God's not going to twist Junior's arm or Jessica's arm. But he is at work in them. We know that's the truth. That's what scripture says. That he wants nobody to perish. That's right. And um, so he's pursuing everybody. And now I don't have this. I am old. I'm 60. Not as old as some, but I'm old. <laughs> older um, than some here. Maybe not yet. Not, not yet. Yeah, I'm still older than some here. <laughs> but and so I'm just saying that, that in my experience. Um, I can see not only in my own, I can see in my own experience, God calling me and me not realizing it, you know, and, you know, there's an old expression, the hounds of heaven. I really believe my mom released those on me. Um, they were um, chasing me. So, and God kind of sent me towards a way. So I know that God has said to me that there is somebody of his people, our people, not necessarily cornerstone, but of our brothers and sisters in the Lord that he is sending or has already sent to Junior's way. But anyway, 
So it's by God's will. So God has a will for every one of us. It says in Ephesians that um, we're not saved by works so that no one can boast. But in that same sentence, it says that God has prepared works for us to do. And so there are service, there are ministry that he has for each of us to do, that he planned before we were even a twinkle in our father's eyes. Before we were a twinkle in God the Father's eyes, I guess. Well, maybe, I don't know if that's even possible. But um, <laughs> anyway, you get it. So he has a will for you and me. And most of the time, we're not pursuing it. We're fighting against it. Um, another thing we learned from those eight verses is that grace and peace comes from him. True grace and peace. So grace is this favor that you don't deserve. Um, and peace is a healing within. So to have true peace, there needs to be this mending inside of you. So all the bad parenting or bad whatever that's come into your life that you've let speak into you and that's how you do things and act things those things for us to have peace those things need to be healed and jesus said that he came to heal those things he said that that he has been anointed um, to preach the good news to the poor and and i think it's not just talking about financial it's talking about these the list of people the the brokenhearted, the, the captive, the, um, the uh, pain, those in pain of heart and so forth, beyond the brokenhearted. Um, anyway, so it, true grace and peace only comes from him. Now, we may be a catalyst of that and a vehicle of that, um, but it comes from him. And then third, we find from this, of course, that he is the father of the son, you know, Jesus. Um, we learned about Paul is that he's an apostle of Christ Jesus and that that's by the will of God. So because we know that about Paul, we know that the father is the one is by his will that the whole plan is made for salvation and reconciliation and so forth. And um, he is he's the one that determines what part in the machinery, if you will, in the army of God that we fit into it and what we're supposed to do. Um, and then Paul, he desires grace and peace for the Colossians. That, that is his, his desire for them. He desires that they be whole, that, that they have God's favor. And then um, we also learn that he prays, that, that not only does he pray individually, but he prays together with a group of people. You know, And scripture says that we're two or three agree. So really the... The, I don't want to say formula, but the plan in Scripture is that we there to be at least two of us. We're really not the church. Me individually is not the church. You're not the church by yourself. It's only when two are together that really we're the, acting as the church. You know, um, you don't have to. The only way we get saved is by Jesus' death, right, and and His resurrection, most importantly. But what I know, I'm not saying but like and add something onto that there's a reason we're saved there he wants to be reconciled to us and part of that it says in first John you can't learn your, your your ability to love can't be perfected unless you're around other people and you love them and they rub you wrong and tick you off and you say oh wait a minute I need to love them um, and so <laughs> you know um, anyway and then in Hebrews, it says that he said, it, there, the writer of Hebrews says, hey, some of you have not been gathering together with other believers, and you, you shouldn't do that. You need to gather together. How else are you going to be challenged? Um, and one version, it actually says spurred on. So it gives us imagery of like somebody with, you know. <laughs> so it's not always feels good um, when you're together, um, even when it's the right way. Because you may not want to hear it, even though you need to hear it. All right, so, and then, of course, Paul is thankful for them. So he prays for them with a group of people, and he is thankful for them. So we learn that um, that's his character. That's something about Paul. He has this love for all of these people. And these people, I think I said two weeks ago, he they were indirectly 
born again because of his ministry, but he, these are more like spiritual grandkids, if you will, um, because the guy Epaphras, he came to Ephesus and came to know the Lord there, and then he took the message back to Colossae, the town that the Colossians are from, and they got saved and became a church and so forth, and, and so he's thankful for them, and he um, prays for them. Now, there's not a whole lot, but he mentions Timothy. Timothy, of course, we know from other scripture is like a spiritual son for Paul. Um, and, but we learn here that he's a, a brother. He's our brother, meaning believers. So, and that's critical, not just because he was male, but this word Adelphius, um, which is in the word Philadelphia, which is love, brother love. <laughs> but the term... Um, could refer to a group of people, not just all a bunch of males, but um, a group of people that had like a common purpose, like a community, a family. So, so that's important that, that we need to be brothers. We need to be siblings to one another. Um, and then he also prays together with others, and he prayed together, he prayed for them. Um, we learn a lot of stuff about the Colossians, I think. Um, in verse 2, it says, that this is addressed to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at that town. Now, um, some versions translate the word rather than holy, translates it saint, which um, may I, both of them are correct. It, a saint is not somebody like the church says, okay, because they did this miracle and this miracle, they're a saint. And there is that, you know, there are people there are denominations, if you will, that they've done that and stuff, but that isn't what he's talking about here. A saint is basically each one of us that are believers. Um, the word means somebody that has been sanctified um, so that they're set apart for God's use. So remember back in Ephesians where it said that God has prepared these works of service for all of us. So there is a plan for us to be holy means that we are doing those things um, among other stuff and the word sanctify that's like one of those you know theology terms but basically it is the process in which someone is made holy so we get born again you know we ask God to forgive us and and from a positional standpoint meaning you know um, because we're now a member of his family we are holy but from a active every day like we're not our mind still thinks the way we always did and so it has to be according to Romans it has to be if we're going to be transformed we have to renew our mind Absolutely. so that that transformation process the the Greek word actually is is where our English word um, metamorphosis comes from um, and so that transformation kind of gives this imagery of like a, a tadpole becoming a frog or a, a, a little um, caterpillar become a butterfly, etc. Those kind of things. There's this. So maybe, you know, there is a cocoon we go in through life. I don't know when we actually become a butterfly. It might be after I die. I don't know. Um, but we're in that process of transformation. And that's what sanctification is. It's, it's the actual process of making you holy. So it sanctification is supernatural, but Part of it is immediate, and part of it is progressive, that as long as you're breathing down here, there's things, and you may go back and forth on them, you know, in your walk. So a saint, which is, so we, these people, he's addressing this to those who are trying to be set apart, living their life for what God's will is for them, and that they're faithful brothers, meaning that that, that community can count on each other. So they're at least some of the people, you know, and you notice he, he addressed it to them. And we, we will find out later in the letter that there are people in the church that maybe they're not actually brothers. Um, or, you know, the thing is we're all in different places in our walk with God. Um, you know, some of us are spiritual infants. Some of us are our spiritual toddlers, some of us are spiritual um, little kids, and some of us are teen, spiritual teenagers, and so forth. I mean, I really believe that that's kind of the way it progresses 
in our walk in the maturity. So um, another thing we learned about the Colossians and really, you know, about these are things that Paul's pointing out that he thinks are good. And so these are things we want to find in ourselves as a community, as a the cornerstone community. We want to be a group of people that are that are truly set apart. We are all called to something, so we all are, there's an intent to set us apart. Um, you know, like this church building, it's holy in the sense that, that it has been set apart for the use of God, that, that we gather together and hear his name here. So that it makes it technically holy. I mean, there may be stains on the carpet and, <laughs> and stains in the chairs and all that kind of stuff, but now, you know, I guess the stains have become holy now, you know, because they've been set apart. But anyway, that's kind of what that the idea is. You know, I think when we hear the words holy, we hear the word saint, it just seems like this insurmountable thing. But it isn't. For one, we have to do it in the power of God. So it means you have to get to know him and turn it over to him, your life and how you live. You know, I think in the... 12 step thing especially the original one um, from the 30s you know it says that you 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 recognize that you can't do it without God you know and I think that's an impasse for a lot of people you know because they want to control their life in some manner or another and maybe they recognize that the drugs are controlling them and they don't want that but they really don't want to have another master um, you know and that's what God is God you know, he's our father, but, and we are to, he, he knows best. He's, you know, he's better than Robert Young, you know, so, so I think most people, except for maybe them, no. <laughs> you've probably seen reruns of Father Knows Best on Netflix, or not Netflix, on Nintendo, or not Nintendo, why? I didn't even get it. Yeah, yeah, but I was just thinking like late late at night, what was that show? Nickelodeon, that's what I was trying to think of a little before all the other stuff, because, you know, my kids watch that. So, um, my almost 40-year-old kids. Um, so next he says in verse 4 that they have faith in Christ. So this is the... Um, the noun version of it, but um, basically faith means to trust and rely upon somebody that you know to be faithful. That's what faith means. Um, the in, in Greek is a lot like Spanish in that there's different forms. There's like a root word, and depending on what's on the front or back of it, it may mean something slightly different. And um, So most of the time when you see in English, the word faith is probably the noun. Um, but like in John 3, 16, the verb form is there, and it's generally translated believe. So when it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes, it's not just meaning that um, I know that this exists. It's talking about this trusting, actually, uh, action. You know, you're actually trusting somebody. So, so for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him. So whoever says, hey... He knows everything. I want to follow him. That's what it's talking about. It's not just saying, hey, I know he exists. I mean, I know Gavin Newsom's the governor, but that doesn't necessarily mean I believe he's the governor. It doesn't necessarily mean I believe in him. You know, so that's the difference. So, um, <laughs> no, a different sermon. So, so they are saints. They are faithful so they are set apart and they're faithful. Um, they, they believe in Christ, so they want to know Jesus. They want to know Jesus and they want to know what, what's important to him and where I need to go in that. So that's important for us. Um, and it says they have a love for all of the saints. So there are people that are set apart and they have this love for the other people that are set apart. That's critical because... What did Jesus tell the disciples at the Last Supper? After he had washed their feet, he said that um, you'll, I, I give you a new command, love each other as I loved you. And then he says, you'll be known by the love you have for one another. You know, when you watch, and you know, some of this is 
the devil's propaganda. But you know, generally when you watch that TV or something or other, we're not, you, you wouldn't come away from that saying, oh, that's what Christians are. They're the people that love each other. Right. Um, you know, and we, you don't, you know, the thing is backing up the truck, so to speak, you know, we're a group of people diverse that, that share one faith and share one God and, and so forth. But we're coming into the funnel different places. You know, some of us are married, some of us are not. Um, some of us um, had to end up in foster care instead of staying with our parents. Some of us maybe should have been in foster care instead of staying with our parents. You know, some of us had awesome parents, um, but we weren't so awesome. You know, or whatever, you know, there, there's just all these things, you know, and some of us have had long lasting relationships that were pretty good. And some of us have had bumpy ones and, you know, all these things have formed us. And then we come into this relationship with God and we've got all that baggage, just like anytime, you know, somebody gets divorced and remarries, you know, they're bringing baggage in from failed past relationships. And, and even though. Maybe they've gotten some healing um, in it, but if they don't really know God and they haven't let God do the healing, then those relationships may end up the same way, in the same pitfalls and the same mistakes. You know, we, we need to learn from our mistakes. Um, but a lot of times the, the lessons we learn, especially before we get to know God, are not the right lessons to be learned. The things that we embrace as truths aren't really truths. And, Paul talks about them and calls them strongholds in um, 2 Corinthians. He says that these false thoughts against the knowledge of God are strongholds. They're, they're things that we turn to. They seem like truths to us because that's what we've experienced. You know? But once we're born again and we begin to engage God, we begin to actually talk to him. So that means reading the Bible and praying, and I believe singing. Um, you have this holistic relationship with him. And then as you begin to experience life from that point, it, it begins to be in this, this context of him. And he, he then real, you then realize that there's a stronghold. And it says that our weapons are, are not carnal, meaning they're not of this world. They're, they are supernatural. And I'm not talking about like, you know, you have like zap or something really like that. But um, we have this transformation going on in us so that we begin to recognize this is falsehood and we can begin to tear down that stronghold. So in a sense, you know, every one of us believers, we're in a 12 step. It's just, we may not be because of drugs or, or some kind of drug, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or speed or whatever. We all have something that was messed up that, that, you know, even if we have the best parents and we've been pretty good people, if you haven't learned the lessons in a context of having a relationship with God, then they're probably going to be off. Some of them might be right, but you may be doing them for the wrong reasons and so forth. So they only start coming into focus in the right context when you have that relationship. So and I'm saying all that because, you know, God told us to love each other. <laughs> That's where that went. I wasn't really like chasing a rabbit or anything. <laughs> So they have love for all saints, and of course, it's the word agape there. Uh, the Greeks had multiple words that we could translate our one English word love in because the way we use our word love can have multiple meanings. You know, it can be a relational type of thing, like, you know, I love ginger as, you know, my wife. Um, but they have, a, that's the word philia in Greek, um, which is basically relational type of love, the, it's the common word for, you know, your love for your parents, your love for your siblings, your love for your spouse, etc. Um, and then they have the word um, eros, which we get our English word erotic from. Um, but it basically is using the word love in the sense of like making love, but not necessarily in a marital relationship. Um, and then we have the word estorge which is like if I use the word love, like um, I sure love that Camaro or, um, you know, or <laughs> I really love pizza, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't love me, but I love pizza. <laughs> um, 
And then, of course, agape, which was a word that wasn't really used commonly because it, it, it wasn't based on conditions. It, it was basically, it, agape means I am going to be patient and kind to everybody, no matter whether they're patient and kind to me. That's what that word means. So it doesn't matter whether they're, they're jerks or not. I mean, it does. Uh, it's going to be harder for you. Um, it doesn't matter where they betrayed you or not because it's not a relational one. It's a, it's a choice that you're making by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be patient and kind to them. So you don't have to have necessarily a deep relationship with them. Um, you know, but God's going to bring people into your sphere. I believe everybody has this sphere of influence. You know, they may have wasted that in the past. But now that you're in this relationship with God and you're changing, now you can be that love, that love that we're to have one another. And that's the love that Paul, that Jesus has said that we need to have among one another. So we need to be patient and kind with each other. So when we choose our words, you know, you know, whether, you know, the tone, obviously, but our words, we need to think, will this be kind? You know, will this be um, well, am I doing this in a patient way? Am I being impatient with them to say these words? You know, I think those are the things that we need to pause and think about, you know. So they have a love for all saints, and we need to have a love for each other. Um, uh, they also, it says, understood God's grace. Um, you know, I think, you know, obviously intellectually we can understand it. Uh, but here... This word understanding means they experienced it. They came to know it. They um, were able to understand this favor that they didn't deserve. That you know, I'm you know, I'm sure just like us, there's all kinds of different things going on in every one of their lives and where they were coming from, and they were. Uh, it says that they understood it. That's in verse six. They understood God's grace and all of its truth is the full phrase there so this is something that this body was known for paul had heard all of this secondhand the testimony of epaphras and other people that had come from that city gave this testimony about them you know and they were i think very sincere they they largely were gentiles so they didn't really have that background of the bible the bible was a brand new thing for them most of them grew up worshiping Zeus and, and Apollos, Apollo and um, Aphrodite and et cetera, you know. So it was foreign to them, you know. Uh, there's only one God. So I think, you know, we're all created in his image. So even though we may have false thoughts and stuff, there's some universalness. I think, you know, most people think that, you know, murder is wrong, you know, and most people think that stealing is wrong and lying. Now, we may justify some of those things, um, you know. Even the Bible, you know, the Bible says, you know, it's translated, "Thou shalt not kill." But the there is there's two Hebrew words. One means murder, and the other one actually could include murder. It's just kind of a generic word for killing. So it could be, you know, like going out and slicing the goat's neck and stuff or the sheep's neck and you know for dinner um or it could be um could mean murder but generally when they were speaking of murder they used a separate hebrew word and that's what's being said in the ten commandments is saying that thou shalt not murder but not to say that uh, we should go out and like beat people to you know close to death or something like that i mean there's you know that wouldn't be too patient or kind with somebody would it so all right, so they understood God's grace, that meaning that, that they came to this knowledge by experience. Um, so uh, they, must have, they were able to recognize God's grace in things, this favor that they didn't deserve. Maybe they got a better job. Maybe um, they had some reconciliation with family. Or maybe uh, where they were coming from, these other people that knew God were accepting them, you know, even though they didn't feel worthy of being accepted. I don't know. We don't know that part of their lives. 
But those are all the things that we're all coming from, and we need to have. We need to be patient and kind to one another. Yeah. Um, we need to set, and we've talked about this, but relationships need to be healthy. So that means you need to determine what is a healthy relationship and stick to those. And when an, a relationship does not have those, you need to not have a, you need to limit the relationship. Um, my oldest son, um, I love all my kids, you know, and um, I love them dearly. And my oldest son, he went in the army right out of high school. He was like 18. And this is right, well, I don't know, a few years after um, the, you know, the war in Afghanistan and Iraq started. So it was, he went in 2005. Um, so a few years after that, they were still, uh, my youngest, I have four kids. The oldest, my daughter, she is 38, and then my son is 36, the one I'm talking about. And then I have a 33-year-old, and then I have a 19-year-old. Um, the 19-year-old, when he was born, um, was the day that Saddam Hussein statue got pulled down. And we were all sitting around waiting for Ginger's um, water to break and all that kind of stuff. And and my son at that point decided he wanted to join the army. I'm like, Rrr. no. Uh, <laughs> but we were trying to convince him to go into Air Force if he, if he had to go into something. But um, finally, I felt like the Lord said to me, I, I've got him in my hands. Don't worry about him. You know, but I knew in my heart that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to come back alive. He could be in heaven, you know. But I didn't share that with Ginger, you know. But um, but I knew God said, "Don't worry about him." And he did. He come back whole physically, but he ended up having PTSD and and dealing with that. He did a lot of self medicating, um, mostly kind of becoming an alcoholic. Um, every night after work, when he got home, he would drink him. He would drink himself um, uh, unconscious, basically, because he said he couldn't sleep at night because he had all these dreams of what was going on there. Um, he was a medic, and there was a lot of kids there that got hurt too. He first he did a year in Iraq, and then a year and a half in Afghanistan, and um, it, there was just a lot of suffering and inhumanity in going on. And, and he had a friend that they both had been trained as medics in San Antonio. One of his friends got ass assigned to, um, to a regular infantry unit, and he got assigned to a Ford uh, FST, a Ford, and anyway, they were like close to the, they were a surgical team, Ford surgical team. So it was kind of like a miniature MASH, kind of, but not MASH. <laughs> Wasn't a whole hospital. Anyway, so even so, I mean, there really wasn't a front line per se in Iraq. I mean, he, he ended up getting the IED blown up and his hearing he has problems with. But anyway, all that stuff, he began dealing with it. The reason I'm talking about this with that, um, he was living in Texas. We were living out here and, uh, and he would call and we would start talking and he would progressively get more intoxicated as we're talking. And then of course his inhibitions would go away and he would say, he'd start cussing and he'd be upset that I wasn't being pissed off by it. Um, and finally I felt like the Lord said um, to me about the prodigal son that um, the, the father did not run after them. You know, when the son came, when the son got saved, so to speak, or when the son changed and came home, he didn't like say, wait a minute, you're not my son. He said, my son was dead and now he's alive. We gotta throw a party. I mean, that's what he said. So anyway, I, I felt I, like the Lord said to me, okay, you know, if he calls, you talk to him, um, but these are the conditions for the conversation to continue. If they begin going this way, then you need to cut it off. And that was really hard, you know, because you're always fearful for your kids, but I needed to trust God to do what he said to do. So I did. So when the conversations began to get slurry and cussing and, and berating and stuff, I'd say, you know, um, son, um, that's not acceptable. Um, if you want to call me back when you're sober, 
I'll be glad to talk to you. And I said, I'm going to hang up now. And so I would hang up. And that was just very difficult, especially for my wife, for Ginger, for me to do that. Um, so eventually, though, I mean, we just prayed that God would put somebody in his life that he would listen to, you know, because it wasn't us. He wasn't going to listen to us. And we could manipulate the situation to get him to, to not take drugs and stuff and do, I mean, he even at one point, um, he was in sleeping in his car, I guess, at some point. He still had a job and all that stuff, fortunately, but so I guess he was, a, what's it called, a functioning drunk type of thing, I guess. But anyway, um, the Lord has transformed him, so, but it took like eight years um, for this to change for us, you know, um, and he just so loves God, you know, and the thing is, he would always talk about God. And, you know, I remember when I was younger and I was raised in church and I remember being out in a bar and talking about God while I'm drunk. So I don't know what that looked like to everybody, but, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I love God, kind of. It's kind of like a bad relationship, but I'm the one that was the bad relationship part of it, I guess. But anyway, so um, they, so the, there's transformation that has to occur in understanding. When understanding God's grace, there's this transformation that begins to happen. And this happened with him and, and um he has just so thrived since he's turned his heart to God. He, he's gotten a church body back there that he's been really involved with and has community. Um, he had, the, the guy that actually kind of led him to the Lord, if you will, was a, a Vietnam vet guy that would come into Home Depot. He was working at Home Depot. I mean, he's trained as a medic, but because of his, his lifestyle, he got fired like at the hospital and things and was working here and this guy um, just told him what's what and because he understood things because this guy was in Vietnam and and probably had, I imagine had PTSD at one point as well I mean I don't know what all went on but he understood it and Sam uh, Richard actually listened to this guy and the Holy Spirit was able to work in him and draw him to God and he began building this community and he ended up getting to go back to work with the, with the Department of Defense because he's already out of the Army by this point. Um, and he had went to work as a medic and, or a, a, not a physician assistant, but that. And then he ended up getting a job as a plumber for the Department of Defense. So, and now and during all this time, he has, um, been learning photography and he had a, like a business on the side and he did the church's photography and all this and um, now he's gone to work for the Park Defense as a photographer but on the side he's involved with this ministry called Wild Ops and they take veterans um, to places like Montana and they go out and fly fish and so forth and he's been there this weekend doing that taking pictures of everything of the, the dogs I guess that go and retrieve the fish I don't know I don't know why the dog would be there at fishing, but um, anyway, there was a dogs and stuff out there, so it was good for him. It, it was a blessing. So there's a process that we go through, and and God loves us all, and He wants none of us to perish. Right. I haven't even got to the lesson yet here. Um, so they love in the Spirit, and then what do we learn about Epaphras? We learn that he's a fellow servant of Paul and Timothy, and he's a faithful minister of Christ. Uh, it says on our behalf, and at first I took that as meaning Paul and Timothy, but I think it's saying all of us. He is he is this a minister that you can rely upon, and he is doing this ministry on our behalf. You know, he stands in the gap for them. That's in verse seven. Um, he taught and discipled the Colossians. So he took the word of God. I mean, he was so hungry, and he, he probably was Greek. I mean, his, last, his name, Epaphras, means like beloved in Greek. And he, he comes to Ephesus, and here's Paul's message there. That It doesn't mention his name in Acts, but that's where he likely was. And he takes that to Colossus. They get saved, and he then disciples them. 
because we learn in verses five through seven that that they learned all this stuff, not directly from Paul, but indirectly from him. Um, so they learned the gospel, the good news, the word of truth um, from him, and they they under they came to understand God's grace in all of His truth. And then it says, and so basically, verse four and eight also is saying that He gave testimony about them. So, so He is this man that um, is a fellow servant. He's a I don't know that he's an apostle, but he is a pastor, minister um, that serves with Paul and Timothy. He is a trustworthy, reliable servant of Christ on our behalf, on the believers of Colossae and Paul and Timothy. So he's standing in the gap for them. Um, he Part of standing in the gap for them is that he's discipling them um, and teaching them all the things of Scripture. As we'll find out later on, there was other people that came into the church, and these people, I think, they're so sincere, they want to know about God, they began listening to this, and it was false teaching, and and uh, I don't know, but maybe they weren't listening quite to Epaphras, so he goes and takes stuff to Paul, and Paul sends this letter back. Um, and But when he went to visit Paul, who Paul's in prison at this point, he's in house arrest in Rome, um, for the gospel. You know, most of us, if we've had any kind of jail, it's probably for something we deserve. <laughs> you know, but he didn't really deserve this. But he didn't see it as some bad thing. He saw it as uh, kind of like when you're in the military and you get redeployed to some place. That's kind of how he saw it, that him being imprisoned in Rome as an opportunity to, to preach the gospel. Remember, I think it might be in Philippians, but he said, for me to live is Christ." But the die is game. Um, so while he's here, while he's alive, it's all about Christ. Um, and if he should happen to die while doing that, awesome. He's going to end up being with the Lord. So <laughs> verses 9 through 14. Um, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Or the kingdom of, yeah, kingdom of light. Yeah. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. So he starts it off with, for this reason, meaning this testimony that Epaphras and other people have given about them, that I just got through giving you the litany of things of them being um, uh, saints and faithful brothers and having faith in Christ and loving each other. Um, and understanding God's grace, which I think is not just an intellectual thing. It's, it's how they were conducting their life and that they loved in the spirit. So their agape was manifest through the spirit, by the power of the spirit of God. So he says, for this reason, since the day we heard, so the day that he got this first got the testimony about them, he has not stopped praying. He actually says, we have not stopped praying for you. So this group of people that he ministered with had not stopped. They'd hurt, you know, can you imagine how exciting that, that you do something, you pour into somebody and, and you find out that they poured into somebody else now. And so there is your, there's this reaping going on. I imagine that excited him just as much as, as the fact that they're, they're serving God in the way that they were. We have not stopped praying for you and asking God. So kind of saying the same thing, praying and asking. So what is it? What was he praying? That they be filled, that, that God the Father would fill you with the knowledge of his will. That's important that we have that knowledge. You know, that way we know where to go. Where do we need to go? So he says, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God um, to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And 
uh, vehicle, if you will, of this filling is through wisdom and understanding from the Spirit. So as they're hearing the word, either by reading it themselves, and most people were illiterate then, so most people had to hear it by somebody reading it. Um, fortunately, and not fortunately, I mean, it was God's will, but the Old Testament, which was the Bible for them, had been translated into Greek like 70 years before Jesus was came to earth. So they had the Bible in their language, and they had, you know, Paul had grew up, even though he was Jewish and was, was a Pharisee and went to school there, he grew up in a Greek city, so he understood stuff. So he's there sharing with these mostly not Jewish people what's going on, and they, they clicked for them because of the Holy Spirit, and this man that was that grew up in their community came back there and talked to them and, and had the scripture there for them. So the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and begins to um, to help us to understand um, what he's talking about as we live our life. So then he goes on in verse 10, he says, and we pray this and order that. So the purpose of praying that they be filled with the knowledge of his will is so that they may live a life worthy of the Lord. So that's part of it. And then also that they may please him in every way, which both those kind of are similar. But if you look at this, live a life, that's that that word, that, those three words are actually one word in Greek, and it means a journey. It means to the walking, how, how you're walking your life. So we all have this journey, you know, we're on. Just like, you know, I'm walking this way, up and things, not paying attention and so forth. And then I come to know God, and this is repentance. I repent, and I begin, you know, finding out what God's saying, and I'm walking, taking a better journey that's not going to end up in the ditch and hurting myself. So it's important that we be filled with the knowledge of his will so that this journey we take will be worthy of the Lord. Um, so this word is translated live a life is a verb. So it's an action that they took that we need to take. We need to, this, this walking that we're doing and the, remember I said that Greek's kind of like Spanish and that it has uh, various forms to it. This word is talking about something that started in the past and has continued on. So this journey doesn't end, you know, it, it, and this process of being transformed. Um, the word is translated worthy is actually an adverb, which means it, it's kind of describing the verb. Of it, so this walk is worthy of the Lord. You know the the way that not just what the Lord did in our lives, but that it it, it measures up to what He wants. I don't think it's like um, let's see, Saving Private Ryan um, at the end of that movie um, where uh, Forrest um, Tom Hanks <laughs> Tom Hanks is dying and um, uh, what's his face from um, John, uh, Born Identity? He's he's Private Ryan. Anyway, um, <laughs> I can't remember what his name is. But anyway, huh? Yeah, Matt Damon. Matt Damon is Private Ryan, and all these people have died. And he says, "Live a life worthy of the cost." Um, you know, uh, I don't know that God. You know, we don't have to make up for the cost or anything, but. But certainly, he wants us to live it to the fullest. I think that's what it talks about when he says, I have come to give life and that more abundant. He doesn't want us just to exist. You know, like, hey, I got my life insurance, my fire insurance, and, and so forth. He wants, he intends for us, our life to be fulfilling. Not just feeling good, but fulfilling and satisfying. So, anyway, and then it goes on to say, to please him in every way. So I think that's kind of describing this worthiness. You know, he has a will for our life. So that is a prerequisite to being able to, to have the journey go the right way and it please God because he has a, a way for us. So if 
our life, is, if our journey is walking the right way in the way that God wants us to, it says, um, continuing on in verse 10, it says that bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, um, being strengthened with all power. So if we're walking the right way, we're going to bear fruit. We will be like an apple tree that doesn't have a bunch of bugs on it, I guess, and stuff. You know, we're actually going to have a crop come out if we um, have got the knowledge of the will of God for our lives. And that's his heart, his heart for them, the heart for, his heart for us, is that, that they would have this knowledge of his will so that they can walk the journey the way it's supposed to go. And that because they're walking this journey the way it's supposed to go, then it'll please God. And you'll be in the right spot so that there's fruit to be born in the things that you're doing that God wants you to do. And that you'll be growing in the knowledge. Now, remember that word is talking about experience. It goes back to like the Garden of Eden where um, it says that this is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, um, and the devil says that... that um, that you will not die, you know, and so he's lying to them because he's wanting them to experience evil. He doesn't want them to just trust God and live the way God designed them. He wants them to actually experience it. And he said, you'll be like God if you do that. That was the lie. God had never experienced evil. He knew of evil, but he had not. So when it's talking about knowledge, it's talking about this something you learn from experience. And the knowledge we have before we have a relationship with God, um, that those lessons generally are wrong in some manner or another. And certainly they'll be put in the right focus when you begin to know his will. Yeah, and it kind of works on itself. So you read the word of God, you've got this information in your head, and then you begin experiencing life with that information and you recognize the truth. And, and so you, it be, begins to build on itself. Um, it says that, so if you're doing this journey, you're bearing the fruit, you're growing in your understanding and knowledge of God, um, and you're being strengthened with all power. Now that power, it says, is according to his glorious might. So you're being powered by his might. So in this process of this journey. And then Paul says that, um, it's kind of a qualifier for all this. He says, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to God. So the, the journey, the, the strength, um, you're going to begin to gain this endurance. Endurance means to, um, to continue doing something even though you're exhausted from it. Um, you know, the best picture of that would be like a long distance runner. And, you know, they've trained for it, but even so, uh, at some point, their lungs start burning and their legs start hurting, and endurance or perseverance is sticking to it, even though you want to drop. You know, and that's, you know, life, we get to know God, but we're still living in this world, and there's still things that happen. You know, you may drive perfectly, but somebody else doesn't, and so you end up in an accident because of them and your car's total, you know, um, things like that are still going to happen in your life and how you handle them, how you're able to persevere in them. And the perseverance isn't just getting through this accident. The perseverance is that I'm still going to bear good fruit. I'm still going to get to know God. I'm still going to have his love, that patience and kindness. That's the endurance part of it. Um, and it says that, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully give thanks to the Father. So these experiences in this journey, you'll be able to give joy to the Father, even though it may not be a joyful experience. Okay. Um, now, Paul goes on and qualifies about the Father. He says, who has qualified you to share? So this, the Father who you're giving thanks to, the whose knowledge, uh, his will you're gaining, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the knowledge of, in the kingdom of light. So this word qualify isn't like, um, 
I passed a test per se. It's more like um, I go to work maybe at Walmart in their distribution center and I want to apply for this job, but it requires driving a forklift. You know, they're not going to just let me sit on a forklift and drive around and grab stuff and things. I have to pass a test that shows that um, I have the ability to drive that safely. So what's being said here is that, that God equips us. He prepares us so that we can share in this inheritance. So he sends his son who dies on the cross and is, is raised from the dead. He leaves his word for us. He sends people into your life that, that speaks the gospel, the truth, the good news. You, The Holy Spirit comes and opens your heart so that you'll receive it and grow from there. So all these things are transforming you, training you, equipping you so that you can share in this inheritance um, of those who are set apart for God, those that... Um, are part of the kingdom of light. So we show the light. This, and he says that we were rescued from the dominion of darkness. So we're, we are in the kingdom of light. We came from the kingdom of darkness. And he brought us into the kingdom of the Son, who he loves. And then he explains that, that the Son is who we have redemption from, the forgiveness of sins, because of this Son. Father, we just thank you for your loving kindness and your mercy that is fresh and new every day. We thank you for your word that you gave us, um, that we can get information about you and understand you. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. 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 Oh, sorry.